but you do get around, don't you? He takes a satisfied sniff and rubs his hands together. His lips stretch into a mischievous smirk. When it comes to graveyards, I'm a kid in a candy shop. All sorts of goodies and gewgaws for the taking. And a bit of rousing conversation. If you know where to dig, that is. Ah, it's a quandary, you see. I'm not exactly welcome in the stone garden. The servants that tend the graves, well, their master, this Riker fellow, caught me nosing around, so he had them chase me off. The spirits within are particularly feisty as well. Can't say why. I'm as gentle as can be. Alas, I'm stuck sniffing out herbs and fungi on the outskirts. He presses a forefinger against his chin and hums. This is when having access to a godwoken might come in handy. You see, beyond the gates there's something that my heart, such as it is, is set on. Well, that's the gold-plated question it is. I dare say you'll enjoy this story. Somewhere in this graveyard lies an object of tremendous power. Or so the legends say, anyway. Belonged to a family buried near here. The Surreys. I've been reading up on them. An ancient clan of eccentrics and oddballs. Fascinating people, truly. Old Joanna was the last. The poor, poor, poor dear. Had no money, no children. Just this incredible heirloom passed down to her through the generations. Problem is, no one knows what this object is. Only that it's an astounding piece of work. Seems Joanna took its secrets to her grave. Rather literally. His coy grin freezes. I can recite each page from memory, but I've neither the time nor the inclination. Tarquin sighs, and his lips unfreeze. For a moment, he looks almost modest. It pains me to say, but you've talents in the adventuring department that I do not. And this heirloom could prove valuable for both of us. I've told you everything you need to... Uh, everything I know. What it is doesn't matter. What it does? Well, if I am right, it will clean up quite an unholy mess. A mess we're both currently mired in. He looks toward the graveyard. Let's make this easy. I'll assume you've accepted my mission. You'll assume I give it in good faith. Beautiful. The Surrey too must be somewhere nearby. And whatever that object is in there, I bet it's... impressive. I do wish I could wander inside. It would be nice to look up some... old friends. See if they're in... good spirits. The lizard hums tunelessly. Not a melody exactly, but more of a meandering moan. Ten spans under, humans slept. Ten spans up, the dwarves were kept. Lizards burned in lasting flame. Elven trees towards skies did aim. Keeping watch, tending graves. She flinches as you move closer. No, no touching. Her humming fades. The eerie silence lasts for several seconds. Riker might get mad. He doesn't like it when someone touches his things. No work. I do it because I like it. Don't cause trouble. Just dig and pluck weeds and shoo the ravens. She shivers and whispers. He's a powerful sorcerer. Lives here in the garden. Can take the you from you. No brain, just body. My mind isn't big, but it's still mine. She points at her head. The servants. They got nothing up there. Riker has it all now. They need to be freed. Only way. Kill Riker. The servants, so lost, chained by sorcerer Riker, but they can still go home to the hall. Set them free. The ensuing silence lasts for several seconds, until she picks up the melody once again and turns away. The eagle glowers at you with one baleful eye keeping the other eye firmly trained on the stringy morsels of rotting flesh dangling from its beak. You dare! You dare touch Master's gifts! No invitation! Leave now! Leave me and Master alone! The spirit is dressed in tattered ceremonial garb. Eagle feathers tangle in his beard, and bird droppings decorate his robes. 
He surveys the circling flock with evident satisfaction. My faithful eagles work still. They know their duty. They need me not. See my feather fall here, prime among my flock. He won't leave my body till naught remains but bleached bone. No ordinary hunger, but a trained hunger. Watch. See him separate spleen from marrow, just so. Hurts, my dear boy, no. All I feel is pride. My featherfall knows just how to slice and just what to chew. He eats to free me, to free this spirit from its earthly ties. With each peck, I am closer to the Hall of Echoes. You watch yourself. There's a voice whispering promises to the dead around here. Word is that they'll be walking about with flesh on their bones again if they send you to the Hall of Echoes. You're Godwoken, ain't you? You've a certain something about your aura. Don't ask me why. But someone out there's got it in for you and everyone like you. Two dwarven spirits at loggerheads. I, I recognize the lass. The royal guard had come to Bon Neffin, right on the sea. The poor, they were disappearing off the streets. The lass spoke out. The guard wanted her silent. In a flash, you are both of them, brother and sister. Your feminine side is a rebel, rising up against the tyrannical queen. Your masculine side is a royalist, loyal to the monarch he loves. As the brother, you rescue your sister from the pikes of the royal guard. Together, you flee across the sea to the melting pot of Driftwood and Reaper's Coast. But in Driftwood, you visit the lizard. <laughs> yeah, we're all curious from time to time. I don't blame him a bit. Sometimes you've got to let loose the beast. You are the sister, and you know that something is wrong. You climb the stairs to rescue your brother, and find him fighting for his life against the dwarves who would rob him. Both of you die. Damn it. Damn it all to hell. Just kids, both of them. But your killers do right by their fellow dwarves, and bring you here to lay you to rest. As spirits, you fight for eternity. One convinced that the Queen is a tyrant, the other that your treason was wrong. I want to say something trite, like, can't they just get along, but I know it's not so easy. Nothing is, especially doing what you think is right. You see clearly then, he stood up for her, she stood up for everybody. It's the true measure of a heart, how you treat not those closest to you, but those you've never even met. His was big, but hers was bigger. The sister smiles. She feels vindicated. Her brother still does not agree. The rebellion was a disaster. The rebellion was a mistake that cost them their lives. Watching the birds pick your body clean is almost soothing. At least you know you're doing some good for a creature. And it means that elf ain't getting his claws on my corpse. Not mine specifically, but he creeps from grave to sepulchre, taking what he wants, whatever he wants. A grim expression passes across her face as she looks out over the graveyard. The dead don't rest easy in this garden, not by half. He lives in the big house by the gate. I ain't about to wander up and ask for a name, mind you. The less I see of him, the happier I'll rest. You there! Help me, please! Some thoughtless fool buried me in this grave to be left as fodder for the worms. I can't be at peace in a place like this. I have to be put to rest according to lizard tradition. The eternal fire burns in the lizard quarter of the cemetery. I beg you. Cast my remains into the fire. Set my spirit free. I will never know peace otherwise. At first glance, the spirit seems much like its host. Hollow, detached. Yet, in its eyes, you see something more ominous. Something not apparent before. Agony. The spirit nods, and its face grows even more tortured. It is trapped. By what or by whom, you cannot say. The spirit ignores your presence, busy as it is resisting the pull of another. 
the ancestor tree trying to take its source. All you feel is the spirit's resistance and its anger directed at the mother tree that has betrayed it. An undead elf steps from the shadows. He looks powerful, but when he speaks, he is in pain. Welcome, Godwoken, to your grave. I promise you decay. I decay. But if I serve, I grow again. I shall serve him. You must die. He is my friend. He is your king. He wants your decay. The spirit looks forlorn, exhausted, spent. Nothing remains of the life you led. The long years after death, resisting the tree as it tried to take your source, have left you with little more than an overwhelming sense of betrayal. Relief flows through you. The spirit slips away. A wave of relief washes off the spirit. Relief tempered with disgust. You are an elven spirit. Who you were in life is now forgotten. You have spent the years resisting the pull of the ancestor tree. It would steal your source. This source you would gladly give to the mother tree. But not this traitor. This scion has betrayed the elves. This scion has taken a darker path. This scion wants your source for someone or something else. This, you think, is what happens when the scions don't get proper training. Relief flows through you as you realize that you may leave. Your thoughts flash to the mother tree by the water on an island with no name. The spirit slips away. The spirit looks angry. You have been a spirit for a very long time indeed. This afterlife has been spent resisting the pull of the ancestor tree that wants your source. You've always hated the scion of the tree for seeking your destruction. Once he served the hated mother tree, you hate her too. But now, the scion has taken a darker path. But he still wants your source. Relief flows through you as a realization grows. You may leave. The spirit slips away. It's hard not to feel some pride in reptilian engineering. I watched an elf spend hours trying to force his way into a lizard's chest. Eventually, he threw it into the flames. But still it sits there, indestructible. He did not leave empty-handed, unfortunately. I pity the poor salamander that he dragged back to his ghastly home. His spirit, it beckons to me. A lone witness to the carnage that must have happened here. I must speak with it. There is an urgency in its bearing that cannot be denied. The Red Prince addresses the lizard spirit. He turns out to be a dreamer, long dead, who speaks archaically and sings in a truly ancient tongue. Rav Mudon, Anan Erket, Vetu Duran. Like a lullaby, the melody lulls them both to sleep until, with a start, the Red Prince wakes once more. My word. Even I, not in my wildest, most demon-lusting dreams, could have guessed a destiny such as this. A tale too preposterous to be believed, and yet so ultimately, so undeniably true once told. The race of lizards, all of us, we were dragons once. Great red dragons. Somehow, eons ago, we withered. We shrank. Our wings shriveled. Never more to be the majestic creatures we once were. Until now. I am to be the father of dragons, and she, the red princess, is to be the mother. I've told you about her, haven't I? The secret of my soul. All my life I thought she was but a dream within a dream, but she is real. She is here. And I must go to her. To think she awaits me even now, no more than a walk away. Come, we must move north at once. Dying indeed. We mustn't forget the House of Shadows continues to hunt us. The dreamer I met only managed to elude them by escaping bodily into the dream realm, never to return. Sacrifices are being made in our names, mine and hers, so that we may sire dragons. I intend to prove worthy of these sacrifices. The Red Prince turns to thank the spirit for its aid. The old soul concludes its melody, and with it, its stay upon this world.
You recognize the dog from the town square in Driftwood. The wounds from his spiked collar are healing well. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm good. Hey, do you smell that? It smells like the fish place, doesn't it? Like fish, only uh, worse. Okay, bye. If graves you dig, I'll warn you now. Beware the creak and then the click. Then comes the bang, then comes the bang. <laughs> Close your eyes and listen. The spirit's memories play out before you in darkest black. The sound alone relates the tale. A self-styled archaeologist, some would call you a grave robber, you found the grave of Baron Wilmot Hogg IV. Your footsteps crunch light upon the gravel as you approach the tomb. You know that Hogg was avaricious, paranoid and cruel, and you yourself value the first of these two traits most highly. You ease your way up to the grave and run your hand around the lid, searching for a trap. You find nothing. The wind whispers in the trees and the grass rustles quietly. You slide the lid open with a creak. Click. Uh-oh, you think. Bang. The silence of the night is rent with a sound of screaming. You're screaming as you burn to death. Commiserations, he says. I knew the risks. If graves you'd open, beware the creak and then the click. Then comes the bang. Then comes the bang. <laughs> I have only one regret. I didn't get the loot. I didn't get the loot. First came the creak, and then the click, then came the bang, then came the bang! <laughs> creak, click, bang! <laughs> Come on, mistress, hear me, heed me! You've always had a glint in your eye for old Zimski. Don't abandon me now. Zimski mutters to himself as he traces sigils in the dirt. He spies you, and a shrewd look brightens his eyes. He stretches out a hand, showing you a solitary coin on his palm. Heads or tails? He flips the coin high in the air. It twinkles beneath the moonlight as it spins down, and he claps it to his forearm. It's tails. Unlucky. But then what do I know about luck anymore? All my life I served Lady Luck and see how it ends. In the dirt. Just the same as everybody else. Turning from you, he crouches back to the dirt. He resumes tracing esoteric sigils, his fingertips swirling through the graveyard clay. A uh, signs the caller. Oh, Lady Luck always came when I called. For 30 years we roamed Rivalon together. She was my faithful mistress, from card game to wager to grift. She was the life of me. Yet she wants no dead man. Now I cannot influence even a coin toss. But you breathe. I'll wager you more use for my gifts than I do. Here, tell me what you truly value. If my lady sees fit, I'll give you what I truly value in return. Good enough. He smiles a foxy smile as he stabs claw-like fingers at your chest. He begins to trace sigils on your flesh. Though you cannot feel his fingers upon your skin, something inside you shifts. You feel a coldness, and a sick longing seeps into your heart. He croons incantations as he works, and his voice is like the throwing of a thousand dice inside your brain. Your body is suddenly filled with lust for coin and craving for more. Ah, uh, now you feel her touch. Now Lady Luck sings in your blood as she once did in mine. And now I feel nothing. The dog growls and bears its teeth at you in a wide, unsettling grin. You swear you see a worm emerge from its grey-pink gums, then burrow back in. Come closer. I dare you. He sniffs. He snarls. <sighs> I am death. There's no defying me. The dog's growls intensify and transform into a rhythmic rasp that mimics laughter. You swear you see the ground behind him momentarily churn and tremble. Do not mock me. You know what lies beneath. But I will not allow you another step closer, Newt. 
Kanna's already laid claim to it. Ha! She calls herself Master. I call her Minion. Whatever name you choose, it is her hand that will wield it, not yours. The dog raises its head to the stormy sky and howls. The earth beneath you vibrates, a dirge plucked on the strings of a rotting lute. Necrotic Troll, you are summoned. Crawl through the gate. The earth opens for thee. The dog's spirit rolls his head around, gawking at the ground and sky as if he's never seen them before, then locks his eyes on yours. He snarls unconvincingly. <sighs> I am. I am death. Anathema, it will be ours. The masses will tremble. Our enemies will bow before the demon blade. Indeed, the masses tremble at my might. We will retrieve Anathema. Our enemies will bow before the demon blade. He moves to lick his haunches and seems taken aback by his own translucence. Once a demon, now a weapon. We heard its call and slayed our allies in its name. It is near. With it, we will slay living and undead alike. There will be no mercy. The canine spirit lifts his head to howl, but can barely manage a whimper. He tucks his tail between his legs, shocked at his own impotence. Well, isn't this rich? Cursed by a coffin and rescued by a random rube. The indignity. She huffs in annoyance and rolls her eyes. Oh, all this trouble and for nothing. Never figured I'd need frost armor. You want me to spoil the story before you see how it ends? I'd never be so rude. She purses her lips and coyly tilts her head. Oh, but do forgive me. I haven't offered you proper thanks. She bows in insincere reverence. Her arm rests on her back, hand mere inches from her staff. She pauses and considers, then rises from her bow. Oh, honey, so naive. Anathema's still out there, and I'm not keen on competition if you get my drift. A jolt of cursed fire flares from her staff, and you brace yourself for battle. Bring it. The spirit's lip curls upwards. She opens her mouth as if to speak, but her words fade in the tomb's chill. The longer you gaze, the more your inner source churns. You are drawn into her, her mind, her body, her past. They are no longer hers, but yours. You sit at a fire. At your left lies a black dog, basking in the warmth. Others huddle behind you. A young elf, a grizzled dwarf, and a skeleton, an undead. You hold a parchment up to the light and point at it. It is there, there that anathema can be found. The sky is dark, and the roaring fire is now a sad flicker. The others lie around it in a circle, but you hear no snores. Their chests neither rise nor fall, their eyelids never twitch. You look to your left, the dog's yellow eyes lock with yours, and the two of you turn from the ring of corpses. And you gasp as you are thrust into the present. You take a few deep heaves, then glance at the spirit. Her mouth continues to gabble, but you're grateful that only silence reaches your ears. Unlike so many other spirits, this one is hardly silent. She clicks and squawks the moment you approach her, like a cornered crow facing down a hungry owl. Are you the new son, then? A pity. Seems the standard is plummeting quickly. You brought my tea, have you? The spirit takes the invisible cup from you and takes a sip of non-existent liquid. I've tasted better brews, but from the look of you, the refreshments won't be improving. She waits a moment. Do you expect a tip? Well, here's one. Soap. Use it. That old thing, it was passed to me by my father, Johannius. And my father's father, Johannius. And my father's... Father's father's father, Johannius. Don't know what happened to the one in the middle. Don't rightfully know what it's supposed to do. Johannius, the umpteens, brought it back from Blood Moon Island. I thought it might be good for stirring stew, but the cook gave it back. Said it made her feel funny. 
whatever that. The spirit stands there smiling, utterly oblivious to her own outburst, leaving you to ponder the strange words she shouted. Mamtenem runekt udil. What just happened? You mean my display of proper posture and etiquette? The benefits of charm school, I don't expect you qualify. Hurry back. The eyebrows still need blocking. You feel the unusual object's vast energy before your hand even touches its smooth surface. Upon contact, the semi-transparent artifact shivers and speaks. You feel you've heard this language before, but where, you cannot remember. And what these intonations mean, you cannot say. Adan, Shvalon Dumorav Narvur Revelis, Awenu Arie, Bemchu Sha'an, Sademenia Veitfen, Domrisval Veid Evrekis. The oblong object is crystal clear and unmarked by marks or chips. It rests snugly in your palm, as if meant to be gripped with a resolute hand. The shard responds with another sequence of unusual and ominous words. This language is beyond your comprehension. The object repeats its unintelligible speech. This thing speaks to me. But what is it trying to say? Sounds like a demon with a swollen tongue. I wonder if what's inside is as pleasant as a demon with a swollen tongue. Wild guess here, but I'll wager this relic will turn out useful for killing. Somehow. <sighs> Doesn't make any sense. I don't want to find out if that's a warning or an invitation. My tongue? It's speaking the language of the Eternals. I mean, it is gibberish, but such beautifully phrased gibberish. It has a nice rhythm to it, doesn't it? Kind of like a song. Beautiful language. Sounds like any other plea for mercy to me. Utter nonsense. As you reach to push open the heavy door, the coils and whirls of engraved wood dance into a new pattern. The semblance of a face arises. A face that seems to look right through you. Why are you here? Tell me, and mind that you tell me true. Silence greets your answer. In the distance, you hear the screech of an eagle. Worryingly closer, you hear some kind of a moan. Time passes. At last, the lips on the door creak open, and the door speaks. Enter. The face melts back into the wood of the door, and the whirls swirl back into a floral pattern. A loud metallic click can be heard from deep within. A visitor? Such a rare and exquisite pleasure. The elf tilts his head backwards, but his squinted eyes don't stray from yours. Call me Riker. Please, do avail yourself of my creature comforts. You've surely come a long way. He grins and waves his hand dismissively. Nothing to be concerned with, I assure you. Mere husks. I enjoy living grandly. I know these aren't ordinary servants, but I prefer the extraordinary. There is no pleasure in mediocrity, don't you agree, Godwoken? Don't be so naive. My doors only open on the occasion of truth. What you admit to them, you admit to me. I also see you are not yet whole. He presses a slender forefinger against his tight lips and hums. Mm hmm. I'm not a generous man, but I could give you what you seek if you offer something in return. A completely fair exchange between sorcerers. Let's not be so secretive, my good fellow. You're dying to show off those smoldering talons of yours. You just don't know how to handle them. I can help you with that. I can share my bond with the source with you, fill your well to the brim, make you a master. The rest of the story, well, it's yours to write. You must go to the Black Pits. There's a cavern there. In it, you'll find a stone tablet of considerable value. He points to the location on your map. Bring it to me. Dizziness. 
It lasts just a moment, but long enough for you to feel Ralik's presence. You hear no words, yet understand. It's imperative you accept Riker's bargain. The episode passes. Riker is peering at you intently. He awaits your reply. Oh, but heading to the Black Pits would mean tangling with more magisters. And they're such a nuisance. I like keeping my hands clean, you see. It's a miracle of the ancients. Priceless, really. And powerful enough to draw the magisters' attentions. I won't bore you with further detail. Suffice it to say, it is safer in my hands than in theirs. Riker's lips stretch and his cheeks bulge, but you couldn't rightly call his unusual grimace a smile. I'm a man of taste, as you no doubt see. A relic this significant would make an incredible addition to my collection. Don't deny an old elf his simple pleasures. A promise you'd best fulfill. Riker bows his head deeply. Then you'll have the power you seek, if not the power that trumps it. There will always be one greater, you know. Now please, don't let me keep you. Tarquin. Ah, that must be the fellow I found snooping in unwanted places. There are some types, deceitful types, that don't deserve to be among a place of such treasure. He doesn't appreciate what the dead can do for us, my friend. He turns the back of his hand towards you and waves it back and forth, nudging you away. Do be sure to see yourself out. These tomes demand my attention. Ah, you again. Any luck in old Lady Surrey's tomb? He places his hand on the artifact, and it drones in its strange language. Adan, Shvalon Dumora Vavor Rivilis, Awanu Ari, Dem Tushan. The object continues. Saden Menier Veet Feln, Dom Drisval Veet Evdekais. It's true then. Anathema, within reach. Tell me, is this all there was? There weren't any other curios in there? Amazing. But not unexpected. He breathes a long, lugubrious sigh. <sighs> it's time I leveled with you. This is the hand grip of the fabled anathema. A sword capable of annihilating anyone. Even a divine. Imagine it. Holding in your hand a force that could wipe away sun and shadow. A sword of life and death. Miracle and sin. A sword of... Atonement. I can restore Anathema to working condition, but this is only half of it. We still need the blade. How fortunate that the hilt has already told us where to find it. Blood Moon Island. Hmm. Isle of Vaults, yada yada yada, Priest Surrey, and so on and so forth. Wow. And it even revealed an exact location. I'll mark it on your map. An exercised demon living in a sword of glass. The hilt was brought here by one of the many Surreys. Not surprised. None of them sound too bright. I can't imagine having even half a demonic sword around was very healthy for that feeble-minded family. They probably winced whenever a black cat came around. You rightfully consider me a scoundrel, but I'd rather you think of me as a... lovable scamp. One that you can rely on. Or perhaps you'd rather place your trust in someone else. Maybe Dallas. I'm sure she'd love to have a weapon that can destroy a godwoken with a simple wink and nod. Well, you may not always have the smarts, but you've sure got the spirit. Blood Moon Island awaits, my friend. It's a bit of a jaunt, but this gives me time to prepare my workspace. We'll catch up in the Lady Vengeance, yes? Tarquin doesn't wait for an answer. His attentions are already turned elsewhere. Mari flashes a massive, horsey smile at you, then winces, her left arm hanging limply at her side. By the seven, that was something. <sighs> What'd I tell you? No scratch on me. None that last, at least. Glad my little guy got to see it. Oh, sure. Just a nasty bruise by the feel of it. May have to lay off blasting beasties for a day or two or after. The fighters lament. Didn't catch your name, though. 
I'm Mari. Pleasure's mine. You all right? Don't know about you, but I never was afraid of bugs. Then again, if you hadn't rolled in when you did, I might be whistling Tidal D in a void woken's belly by now. I owe you one. A bug squasher, are you? Impressive. I hate to cut this short, but I ought to dash off. My boy's waiting for me. Mind lowering the bridge, though. I find myself slightly indisposed for the moment. And how's my little spider monkey doing? Safe and sound. Spider monkey? You mean dragon? Come here, you. Mother and son fall into a tight embrace. One tear rolls down Mari's nose, falls on the black stubble on Barin's head. She strokes the wet drop away, smiling. Mari seems oblivious to you. Her eyes are closed, her lips turned in a serene smile as she strokes Barin's head. My boy, my good, good boy. Hey, wait one sec. Ma, Ma, look! Thank you so much for helping my Ma. All those void woken. Sheesh, thank the gods everyone is okay. Thank the gods. Oh, thank the mum and our friend here too. Believe it when I see it, but hey, I know a good arm when I see one. I'll tell my cousin Raymond what you did. He's real high up in the order and he's visiting Driftwood as we speak. Could be he has some good work for you. Reckon there's space for us in the Magister's barracks. Ryman ought not to turn down his own cousin. Some dwarves, locals, attacked a Magister caravan. Must have been sorcerers inside. Voidwoker must have sensed them. Came in formation like a proper battalion. Never seen anything like it. Mari looks to Barin and flexes. He does the same back at her. Luck wishes. We're off into town. Best of luck to you, mate. And come say hi if you make your way inside. The shaggy dog keeps his distance, wary eyes sizing you up as his hackles rise. You run away. Everyone here run away. All run. All run from something. I knew. All runaways round here. I run away from bad man. Very bad man. Man wanted to make me spider food. I know. I can sniff good and bad. Riker bad. Bad man. So bad. I liked his house. Big garden of stones. Lots and lots of bones to dig. Good tasty bones. But when I sniffed him, how he is for true, I ran and ran and ran. He pours a few tentative steps closer and sniffs all around you, nose wrinkling with concentration. Some bad. Most good. Good enough. Good enough. He bounds forwards and licks your face effusively. His breath stinks of graveyard clay and ancient bones. Immediately, you feel an allergic reaction developing on your cheek, hot red blotches spreading in an angry rash. The dog scurries away to sniff about the area, leaving you with his approval and an itchy face. Gareth toils in monotony. Gareth freezes, then turns slowly towards you. His breath a steady, his voice a monotone. I'm digging my own parents' graves. You'll have to forgive me for not being first-rate company. Gareth moves to continue his task, but his cadence falters. He pauses, silence hangs, begging to be broken. No, of course you didn't. Godwoken, I've seen Seeker's blood seeping into the sand. I waded through corpses on the deck of the Lady Vengeance. But when the lifeless eyes looking back at you are your own mother's, I just didn't know. I didn't know what darkness lied beyond pain. Now, well, now I do. Dallas's pets. Such helpful tools they are too. The abominations do the dirty work and the whites keep their robes clean. Convenient. They're still there, spreading their rancid smell through the house. Paladins came to clean up the mess. In the name of Lucian, they say, and they seem to believe it. Gareth shies away from you. His eyes pass over the half-filled graves, and he takes a shuddering breath. I'm... I'm the one who has prayed. An endless litany. How many pleas does it take? How many tears do I have to shed? How much must I lose for the gods to listen? Gareth forcefully exhales and looks past you to the nearby house. You fear he might snap the shovel's handle in two. 
I've got no use for platitudes. Not from some mediocre sorcerer, inexplicably chosen as the seven special pet. You swear you hear Gareth's pulse, galloping faster than a saddled mount. You've never heard such a thing before, but you suspect Gareth's heart is close to tearing. If you want to help, then you find the craven white that ordered their slaughter. Anyone that stands between you and truth, no matter the flag they fly or creed they follow, make them bleed! His clenched jaw tightens further, and then, in an instant, Gareth's guard is broken. Tears well in his eyes. With every blink, a pearl of grief falls to his cheeks. My parents, they did nothing to deserve this. They were good. Honest. More honest than me. I'd give my own life to bring them back. I never... I never got that last chance to tell them I love them. I never got to say goodbye. You're right. There's nothing more to be done here. Lucian, forgive me. And please, Godwoken, please forgive me too. 